Our first speaker for the session is Dr. Adnan Mahmoudovic, and he is a Bosnian Swedish writer and an associate professor from Stockholm University. His major academic work include Ways of Being Free, Authenticity and Community in Works by Rashdi, Ondaj, <coughs> Craft of Editing, and Future in Comics. His major creative work includes Thinner Than a Hair, How to Fare Well and Stay Fair, and At the Feet of Mothers. His stories and creative nonfiction appear widely in the UK and US magazines. And his essay, Comics, War and Ordinary Miracles, has been adapted for BBC Radio. He is a recipient of many awards for fiction and has served a judge on a number of literary prizes, including the Newstack Prize for Literature. We welcome you, sir. So our second speaker of this session is Dr. Tony Latinen, and he is a postdoctoral researcher at the Tempier University, Finland. His doctoral dissertation is dealt with ecocriticism and the metaphor of the land as a woman in representation of the Arctic wilderness. Dr. Latinen has published several eco-critical articles on Finnish literature and is also the editor of several publications, including the first Finnish eco-critical anthologies. He is currently engaged in his research project, Environmental Risks, Dystopias and Myths in Contemporary Literature. We welcome you, sir. The chair for this session is Dr. Shailendra Singh, and he is working as an assistant professor in the School of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, Oro University. He has completed his PhD from Jamia Mia Islamia, New Delhi, India, and has a master's in English literature from Hindu College, University of Delhi. He is the youngest recipient of the Minakshi Mukherjee Prize for the best public academic paper in India, 2016-17, awarded by Indian Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies. His research interests include peasant narratives, gender studies, nationalist fiction, and Premchand's literary corpus. We welcome you, sir. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti, for that kind introduction. Uh, so without wasting any further time, uh, it's over to uh, Dr. Adnan Mahmoudovic. The topic of his presentation is Iyavala versus in Sweden, we shake hands. Sir, over to you, over to you. Very good. Thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, to present at this conference. Uh, it's, it's, it's been going uh, really well already. The first session was really great. Uh, so I hope um, that my small contribution will, uh, will be uh, okay in this. Uh, my, my take here is going to be a little bit different. Uh, this is uh, going to this is based on an article for uh, TRT World that I wrote um, uh, together with a couple of colleagues some time ago. Uh, so uh, this talk will focus on the viral spread of transnational humor in the times of COVID-19, um, the, the pandemic. And I will argue that uh, the coronavirus pandemic has brought in a new spark in our um, increasingly robotic behaviors. Uh, an uh, outpouring of humor seems to help us deal with anxiety about sickness, death, economy, and the shortcomings of our political leadership. Uh, above all, I will suggest that the types of humor that emerged and the ways that it changed week by week or even day by day are symptomatic of our local cultural makeups so, uh, insofar as we are all global subjects but perhaps not equally global citizens. Uh, the humor uh, shows that we are all, as individuals and communities, like the, the story with the emperor without clothes, that we are caught with our pants down. Uh, humor helps us deal with reality, and the, the current pandemic is a testament to that notion. I want to argue that uh, uh, the local and global jokes are symptomatic, not just of how we are living the, uh, the pandemic, but also how we're imagining the aftermath. Uh, I think as a populist, we are not using imagination enough. 
And I'm here not talking about the imagination of specialists concerned about the future, but as kind of as a global, uh, global subject. So uh, a global pandemic is no laughing matter, or is it? The coronavirus pandemic has changed our behavior significantly and it's instilled fear in many, but it has also led to an outpouring of humor. Take, for instance, all the toilet paper memes, such as, you know, Jesus multiplying toilet paper rolls, or the video with the guy who cleans the New York uh, subway turnstile only to jump over it. Uh, or the picture of a Bosnian gastarbeiter or a migrant worker in Germany who is in his living room with a cement mixer in a working from home meme. Then there are all the halal memes and the equivalents from other religions. Uh, I have tried to follow the, the development of humor which mainly appears in the, in the form of memes but also videos and classical types of jokes. Uh, and um, I think while a more thorough study is needed and can only be done once the pandemic is over, I think one can, with a bit of effort, already see quickly changing trends and transnational influences. I think the speed at which the types of memes appear and exchange one another is really quite staggering, uh, which shows uh, that we easily adapt but also that the jokes lose their power quite quickly and new ones have to take place to cover new issues that the pandemic brings up. Uh, so what I mean about jokes losing power or energy is a reflection on jokes one used to hear when growing up. And often I, I, I say that those jokes traveled with salesmen from town to town and lasted for years. Uh, and some are still like oral testimonials of certain historical moments, like the Cold War, for instance. You know? So I'm, I'm originally from Bosnia, from former Yugoslavia, so, uh, so uh, I, that's something I remember. And I assume some of the corona memes might become such historical classics, but at the same time, it's not very likely either. I think... Um, so some of the, the initial corona jokes poked fun at people and, uh, you know, politicians taking the pandemic too lightly, laughing it off, you know, or choking it up to some made up internet fad. Uh, most countries aimed jokes at their political leadership, which could be classified under this uh, emperor has no clothes category. Uh, and still, you know, the political types of jokes abound. You know, that's still, that type is, is still going on. I mean, how could they not uh, when, um, you know, uh, the living joke that is the US president uh, keeps raising the bar of ridiculousness? It is almost as if the jokes cannot catch up with his ability to be a global joke especially in, re really in relation to amazing leaders of smaller countries like New Zealand's Jacinta Ardern, who doesn't provoke much transnational humor. Uh, some jokes reveal panic or mock panic. Uh, most jokes, like in uh, Roberto Benigni's uh, movie, Life is Wonderful, seem to be a way of coping with fear, just as you know, excessive hoarding or, or panic buying is a way to handle anxiety. Uh, many of us who have experienced war or, or been refugees have seen this before. You know, a sign, I think a sign of authenticity in any creative endeavor, you know, we use imagination that deals with catastrophes and traumas is that it can relate to a local sense of humor. And the same holds true for the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I think the endless feed of jokes uh, is revealing uh, of our cultural makeups and how we are changing. Uh, you know, I myself and many of my friends with whom I've explored this topic uh, are Swedes with multiple ethnic origins, so Bosnian, Pakistani, Turkish, German, Kashmir, you know, so many, you know. Uh, and we have intimate experiences of, you know, of you know, so many different cultures and we can recognize the local styles of humor, particular you know, to those cultures that we belong to. But we are also global subjects and like so many of us today, 
uh, we can see how humor has become more transnational. Some jokes are indeed so local uh, that they are, you know, untranslatable, and we would need, you know, an entire essay to, to you know, for each to, to to convey their meaning. But most of them, I feel, I feel, however local, are not terribly hard to get. You know, and in many ways, humor is becoming more and more, you know, this born translated uh, thing. So, for instance, uh, the following joke, uh, which is local to Bosnia, is entirely symptomatic of the culture of jealousy in, 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 in the Balkans. But I think it translates ag across borders. So it comes from uh, the saying that Bosnians can forgive each other anything uh, except success. So the joke goes as this, a man uh, sees that his neighbor has contracted uh, COVID-19 and he says, that's not fair. You know, why did he get it and I didn't? Uh, meanwhile, in Sweden, uh, a typical meme uh, is a picture of a bus or a bus stop uh, with spaced out passengers, you know, a couple of meters be uh, between them with a caption. In Sweden, we do not sit close to each other. We are best at avoiding company. This crisis was made for us. And this is so interesting because, you know, the, both of these play with these stereotypes about, about these uh, ethnicities. And yet, uh, right now, almost as if out of spite of these stereotypes, you know, Swedes, for instance, have been outdoors more, you know, more than ever, like, like their lives depend on, uh, on it. Like here in Stockholm, uh, you know, the government says, you know, stay at home, you know, social distancing and so on. It's not enforced, it's recommended. People are out in restaurants and, and you know, it is the spring, you know. So, uh, so, uh, so it's like the new joke is like that the fika or the, the, you know, these coffee breaks, it has to go on. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the spring sun is more important than, uh, than anything else. Um, now, while the memes and jokes during this pandemic are a kind of direct satire of our local contexts, uh, I, I feel a lot of times they have universal appeal. The first wave of memes all over the world were actually ethnically charged. Um, and still many are, you know, showing racist attitudes uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, and either enforcing old or creating new us versus them binaries. And this us versus them figures in many global corona conspiracy theories. Um, it's just that uh, uh, in local context, we just exchange the ethnicities of the bad guys, you know, who, who lies behind it and so on. I think you're aware of it, all these. A typical example in, in, in many places is, you know, uh, okay, here we blame Muslims. And in other places, you know, Muslims will say, oh, we'll blame the infidels, you know, things like that. Uh, there are so many jokes uh, about this. Um, Speaking about Muslims in, in, in Western countries, I think it's, what's interesting is how the corona uh, has managed to kind of bring about, you know, the, the corona humor has ridiculed some, of, some prejudices. You know, for instance, suddenly it's not just okay to wear facial cover, uh, it's, it's actually mandatory in many places. Uh, which used to have fines for women who wore facial cover, we, even though it's really rare, but still, you know, you, you know the French cases and other cases. I, I think one of the most internationalized jokes is about handshakes. Uh, so TRT World, or Turkish Radio and Television Corporation, uh, suggested using uh, the, the, the globally uh, popular Ertuğrul uh, style Eyvallah gesture, uh, instead of, uh, this is the hand on the, on the heart greeting, instead of handshaking, which became a hit all over the world. But actually, really interestingly, particularly in Sweden, uh, where, uh, where, you know, the most recent elections, uh, Muslims have been used quite a lot uh, negatively uh, in, in the discourse uh, to, um, uh, 
especially this practice uh, of you know not shaking uh, hands uh, uh, with with the, the opposite gender uh, and uh, uh, the prime minister uh, said in Sweden we shake hands that was like a firm you know prime ministerial uh, you know statement and suddenly now it's actually out of vogue now no one is shaking hands and um, so the kinds of jokes or memes that, that are uh, multiplying are these halal memes uh, which are used to fight Islamophobia and uh, you know some call them even the creeping Sharia memes uh, we simply see you know, just a lot uh, more exchange of, uh, of inter intercultural humor. And to be sure, the spread is uneven, but there is no way to predict you know, what local jokes might resonate on the other side of the globe. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting how the cross fertilization of humor is uh, is happening and, and it's really quite exi exciting to see what travels and what doesn't travel and where it travels. Uh, if, if you know, think of popular culture, which is usually a treasure trove of hilarious characters uh, with uh, transnational appeal, um, it's, it's uh, you know we have the the memes like you know the Michelangelo's hand of God is giving hand sanitizer to Adam, or we have the Corona Lisa, the Mona Lisa with a gas mask. Uh, but I think they thought it was really interesting to see how some of these um, some global icons of you know popular culture like Al Pacino and Sylvester Stallone appear in more local contexts. Uh, like in the Balkans, for instance, where um, where you know a number of us actually grew up with you know that popular culture in the 80s uh, and the 90s. So so we find memes with um, you know Scarface with Al Pacino guarding a stash of toilet paper. We have uh, Rocky. Uh, Sylvester Stallone uh, having a fight at the supermarket, you know, with old people over toilet paper and sugar. Uh, and I think th these memes, it, despite their use of global stars, do not seem to travel well. They are very local, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, whereas culturally specific memes can actually travel and cross borders successfully. And in, in some cases, we are starting to understand, you know, what is funny for Pakistanis, Indians, Bosnian, Swedes, the Chinese, yeah, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so I want to say that despite uh, a deluge of humor, I feel that, you know, this, this seems to suggest a kind of innovative, uh, you know, imaginative use of imagination and so on. I feel that we are not using imagination enough. Uh, jokes seem to bring about, you know, a strong focus on the now, it's actually a kind of a hyper presentism that Professor Slavik mentioned in the previous talk, in one of, in the first talk, I think. Uh, we are coping with the immediate concerns and are seldom looking into the future. So in some way, uh, I feel that the image, imagination about Corona or the COVID-19 in the present is, is showing certain deficiencies in our global imaginaries about the future. Um, and, uh, you know, as I'm speaking here, uh, more humor keeps popping up uh, to help us fight the now, the current common enemy, COVID-19. We sure hope that uh, to be even more prepared for COVID-20, COVID-20 Pro, and COVID-20 Lite coming this autumn in online stores near you. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really interesting wherein, uh, you know, human is constantly trying to evaluate its relevance from moment to moment. And, and as you rightly pointed out, uh, the imagination is more on the here and the now, as opposed to, uh, you know, being uh, engaged in a more productive way. And I can relate with this because in India, we had a case of uh, Corona Baba, who was arrested by the police. And then, th then we had Corona Likert that was claiming to, you know, find a cure for, let's say, uh, yeah. So it's over to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Tony. Uh, the topic of his presentation is From Zombie Apocalypse to Silent Spring, Framing the COVID-19 Pandemic. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Tony, please go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you.
Am I able to share my screen? Yes. Yeah. I want to thank you all for inviting me and, and uh, it's very nice to participate in this event. Uh, first, just a few words to frame my presentation. I'm a literary scholar from Finland, but I arrived in Seattle as a visiting scholar just when this corona madness began. And now I'm writing an essay with my colleague in which we deal with these first-hand observations, media frames, and feelings of fear that corona has raised worldwide. And the first frame I want to bring up is zombie apocalypse. The effects of the pandemic were not the first thing that I noticed arriving to Seattle. On my way from the airport, I noticed camps of homeless people along the freeway. And since my last visit in Seattle, 2014, Amazon and Microsoft have moved their headquarters to Seattle, dramatically raising rents in this area. And the next day I passed by a food distribution center and I was surprised by the explosion of poverty. Same evening, I saw an episode of popular TV series, Walking Dead. And for the first time, I started thinking just how much these modern zombies reflect the American fears toward the homeless. The next week, the whole city closed down and the flights to Europe were put on hold. And I started to think about the zombies again. For 80 years, this undead from Haiti have been used by American filmmakers and writers as a metaphor for deeper fears. Racial sublimation, atomic destruction, communism, globalism, and of course, mass contagion. The cannibalistic zombies embody the fear of the other and raises our most primitive fears to be eaten by somebody or something. Walking Dead series has been seen as a new kind of term in the genre. It represents a post-apocalyptic hellscape where zombies are the least of the survivor's problems. Walls are prominently featured as a way to keep out not only the zombies, but other humans as well. After the national emergency was announced in the US, the fear of the utter intensified. There were already several stories published in various newspapers where the pandemic was attached to zombie imagery. For example, in California, with the biggest homeless population in the country, some politicians considered the corona crisis as a zombie apocalypse. Only a few weeks earlier, Psychologic Today magazine specifically warned about comparing the outbreak to a zombie apocalypse and raising panic. But these grim metaphors spread fast and for many Americans, the crisis raised the fears of violence. In fact, last March in the US was the second busiest month ever for gun sales, trailing only January 2013, just after President Barack, Barack Obama's re-election. Another frame, a ghost town. Suddenly, Seattle is referred as an American Corona Ground Zero, and it turns into a ghost town. Space Needle is closed. Amazon headquarters are abandoned. Seattle Great Wheel stops on the shore of the Pacific Ocean. Only the homeless people are left in the city, and media is filled with pictures like this, pictures of empty towns. And as I walk along in the downtown of Seattle, I have a weird but strong experience of supernatural, a feeling of liminality, like I'm trapped between this world and the unknown. But I'm not alone. People from all over the world are seeking for biblical or, and supernatural explanations for the crisis. Frank Germode has claimed that humans are uncomfortable with the idea that our lives form only such a short period in the history of the world. So we look for a coherent pattern to explain this fact and invest in the idea that we find ourselves in the middle of the story. 
And in order to make sense of our lives, we need to find some kind of a consonance between the be beginning, middle, and the end. So people living in the middle of them believe that the end is very near and that their own generation is the one with the, res with the responsibility to usher in a new world. And of course, stories with, uh, of the end also allow us individuals to reflect on our own debts. And although my experience of the Dead Seed is highly personal, at the same time, it's constructed by collective imagination. Ghost towns are the most common hellscape in the post-apocalyptic fiction, where wars, natural disasters, or pandemics wipe out the human race from the face of the earth. And the ruins of the mighty cities of an exciting setting for adventure reflecting our collective fears. They bring out a mixture of emotions that includes horror, nostalgia, regret, but also a kind of thrill, a sort of sublime excitement. Often these urban labyrinths also represent a metaphor of mind reflecting loneliness, estrangement, and other mental sufferings. In other words, these kind of metaphors are actually strategies for our mind in understanding the world in which the known and unknown is always changing. Another frame, Silent Spring. One day I'm standing in a line to the nearest grocery store. People are quiet, afraid, wearing masks, keeping their distances. There are posters on the street like poles that beg landlords to forgive unpaid rents during the crisis. And as I leave the store, I buy this magazine called The Real Change, as the profit of the paper goes to the low-income low people living in the Seattle area. And you can see in the cover of this magazine stands a very familiar headline, Silent Spring, City Shuts Down. And as you, many of you know, in Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, the chemical industry poisons the small village, killing the birds first. In fact, the word virus derives from Latin word meaning poison. And in the cover of the magazine is also an illustration of the Seattle skyline with its landmark space needle and familiar magnolia trees, now blooming with purple viruses instead of flowers. The silence of the city sounds like an objection to the one of the world's biggest ongoing megatrends, urbanization, which is based on an idea of big cities generating welfare states. Accordingly, in economically advanced countries, the rate of urbanization is already very high and increasing urbanization have been presented as a key to the econo economic growth worldwide. However, for many years now, researchers have been warning about the dangers of urbanization. In big cities, it's impossible to control life-threatening epidemics or pandemics. And as a complete opposite to Carson's dystopia, during the corona crisis, it is the birds now that can be heard after traffic has slowed down. The media is flooded with pastoral imagery. Dolphins swim in the canals of Venice. The top of Himalaya can be seen for the first time in 30 years. There are coyotes at the Golden Gate Bridge. Some, goddess, some consider this as a utopian turn that will lead the way in the fight against the climate change. Still, some of these reports turn out to be fake news. The bogus stories give false hope as some people really want to believe in the power of nature to recover. And there are also dystopic counter-narratives available. For example, in Thailand, tourists have disappeared and the local monkeys are starving, so they attack each other in a rage. And this again reminds me of post-apocalyptic fiction. The stories about dying cities are not stories about human extinct extinction, but dystopias of Western countries losing their wealthy lifestyle. And the last frame, war. On the news, Donald, Donald Trump, one night he announces that USA in, is in a war against an invisible enemy, 
the Chinese virus. Immediately CNN publishes an analysis of the metaphor. Like in a war, a pandemic has a life and death decisions. An enemy who can strike at any time, battles on the front lines and calls for the home front. This patriotic metaphor shows the need for everybody to do their part, to take the social distancing orders seriously. And for the businesses, that means shifting resources towards stopping the outbreak, whatever in terms of supplies or manpower. And like during the wartime, people are exposed to rumors, disinformation, even propaganda. First, I followed the news every night for hours. But as the United States become the leading country on diagnosed corona cases and an endless stream of stories about grief-stricken families start, my anxiety grows. The final nail is driven in when the TV reporter Chris Cuomo gets sick. And now this hyper-masculine figure cries in television, fearing for his own death. Then I myself, I start to panic and consider leaving the country. Many risk psychologists have shown that big numbers of victims can numb the human mind, and abstract numbers evoke less empathy than news stories about individuals facing terrible events and disasters. During the first weeks, I have developed a similar relationship with the TV host Chris Cuomo that I have had with many fictional characters in novels and movies. Although I find his theatrical style amusing, his sickness is a psychological trigger. Accordingly, it has been proven that aggressive repetition of shocking pictures in media can make audiences petrified, hopeless, and passive. After giving up on television for several days, I found myself revitalized, and I'm deciding to stay. As I googled the words media, panic, and corona, I came up with two very interesting results. First, the studies already show that American media is responsible in creating collective panic. Second, the media itself is in panic. Publishing is losing advertising revenues as companies are bracing themselves for an economic turndown. In fact, the toll of the coronavirus on the news media could be worse than the 2008 financial crisis, which saw new newspapers experience a 19% decline in revenue. So to summarize, COVID-19 pandemic is, is, is an example of a news story that falls out the daily routines. In these rare occasions when typical news frames prove inadequate, journalistic practice co-ops models from literature and from popular culture to frame and to manipulate the coverage. These frames do not only organize the events in understandable patterns, patterns but they also color them. And in framing the COVID-19 pandemic, American media has succeeded in creating a social and economical panic that feeds off from itself. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. So it's over to questions now. Uh, let's have two questions and the answers could be short because we are uh, literally running out of time. So please, let's have two questions. Yeah, anyone has a question? Any question from the listeners? I think there are no questions. Okay. It's not 
Okay, there is a question. Why Trump is not going to completely lock down in US? That is the question. So uh, I think it's it's for the second speaker, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, please. Anonymous. Yeah. What what was the question? Why Trump doesn't? Yeah, I'll I'll repeat that. Uh, why does not uh, why does Trump not go for a complete lockdown in the US? That is the question. Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer, but I think he's under a lot of pressure. He's trying to please the econ economic forces behind him. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Over to uh, Dr. Om then. Uh, thank you, Selene. Thank you. Thank you for putting it down.